uh, as, as a group, have put quite a fair load of money into helping a number of businesses from this program. And one of our businesses, one in fact that's got a small sum of money from Richard Branson earlier in the summer, was featured on that program last night. He didn't get any money from it today. But next week, if you watch the program, maybe two, three, nine o'clock Wednesday night, <laughs> repeated late night on Friday, you'll see a pastor business from Huddersfield that did get quite a few thousand pounds from this program. And all I'm saying by that is that these businesses are beginning to just catch the attention. And, you know, it is possible to actually do this within a degree as opposed to simply adjunct to it as an option across someone's university. So that's the background to it. Here are our objectives today. As much as anything, is to update you on the situation, to explore some of the issues, particularly, I, I think, the postgraduate issues, because they're, they're slightly more complex, I think. With the undergraduate programmes, you, you are not particularly ambitious about the nature of the business. But with the postgraduate ones, you are more ambitious about the actual business, and therefore the complexities are greater. Uh, if we actually thought that the basic components of, of entrepreneurship are opportunity and risk, I think these are a real opportunity for people. At the same time, there's a bit of a risk, because academics are definitely going outside their comfort zone to do this. And, uh, I suppose actually if we looked at the, at the context of this conference and, and asked the questions, are, entrepreneur, are universities truly entrepreneurial, then one, one might very, very tongue in cheek say, if you don't have a program like this, it's impossible to say you're an entrepreneur at a university. <laughs> but then again, I'm um, Right. <coughs> These are unusual programs. They involve real learning by doing and real learning from doing. I'm going to say, they're not right for everyone, for obvious reasons. A country venture creation element is an integral part of the programme, but it's not mandatory. Um, at Buckingham and Huddersfield, it is integral and compulsory. Can I, can I yes, say, yeah. The reason we don't make it mandatory, and we've talked, we three have talked at length about this and partly the reason we were invited to the venture creation program is because it's actually quite an ambiguous notion to my mind to talk about venture creation programs uh, as being integral to the program if if there is any degree of artificiality about the way those new businesses are created uh, our argument is you take the horse to water you give them all of the tools but you don't force them to take the business startup option. And that's the, the, really the difference between us. We don't make them do it. We encourage, incentivize, support, uh, everything else but that last step of saying you must do it. And I'm really um, dithered a lot actually uh, through, through our conversations about whether we ought to make it a mandatory part of the programme or whether we shouldn't. And the, the thing that stops me is that every time we've tried to create artificially a situation, whether it's building entrepreneurial teams, whether it's creating businesses and getting students to run them, we've completely fallen flat in our face. It almost has to be organic in, in our experience, or it doesn't work. And so that's sort of what stopped us going the, the, the next step. We, we've built in a fallback, obviously, for those people. I mean, it's an, in a sense, it's an aspirational thing but essential at the same time. If they can't meet the aspiration, there is an effective fallback. But they don't start out with the thought, this is optional, they start out with the thought, I have to do it, but there's a safety net. So it's just the, it's just the way you set these things up. On, on our one, um, they, they pitch uh, for up to £5,000, and if they fail in their pitch, um, then their role is to go, and go to those who've got money and show what value they can provide uh, to, the, to, the, to the other teams. And it forces them to think about team cooperation, which is not something that naturally comes to many entrepreneurial students. They like to work on their own. Our final fallback is, for the first five years, we never had a problem with people either going on or finding somebody or doing something. Um, last year, for the first time ever, we had a problem where two lots just didn't get their act together. One, I 
throughout, basically. And, and the other one went on its own and is has gone up and will come back again. And, and one other, um, we've actually pushed him into a place where he is working. So it's, it's a very difficult task. But they know from the start that the whole point is you're going to develop a business either your own or working with somebody else. I think it's worth the point before I finish on this slide to think actually of the context of this. And, and, and of course, all of these television programmes are contrived, they're all made for a particular audience. At the same time, they are unbelievably popular and you can't escape that. And it does make you think, you know, what are we, what should we be doing to respond to this growing interest in self employment? doing something for yourself that's being promoted by television. I think generally it's a positive thing. I don't think it's necessarily totally robust in, in, in many ways, and I don't defend it, but I, I, I actually think we must go with it, and we, we have to have effective responses. I just wonder whether it's going to be a, a situation where, in the not too distant future, we end up with celebrity students. Um, <laughs> we, we, we had one. He came to us through clearing. He got offers from um, Lancaster, Manchester University, and he said, I'm on the television programme, he's on in the autumn, he's already got his place, he's in there, and he's sort of selling himself to us. It's like, well, actually, you know, I've already achieved some notoriety, what's it worth for you to take me? If I can offer a strategy lesson, we had a bit of a star uh, student uh, in the sense he's got an enterprise going and had lots of going press on it and thought he was a hero. God, he's a pain in the arse to have him go. <laughs> Other students kind of found him very arrogant, didn't do the, uh, do the work. So it's a double-edged sword. Absolutely. You know, to begin with, it's great because, you know, he was keen to be uh, was seen as a bit of a kind of, a, you know, an image uh, or emblem for them, but uh, he was a horrible student. Well, we've, we've got an example where somebody went off and started a business which he was going to do with a group of student members, and basically a, a, a student letting agency. And he went and took the name and spread it himself and went and did it and took another separate student with him. Interestingly, my two that were left are now competing against him in a very small uh, working environment. They're doing, in, in, in my opinion, much more professional. It'll be, he's, he'll be wonderfully successful. Not, not as a pretending that there aren't issues. There are <laughs> serious issues to deal with. Uh, but on the other hand, the, the world is changing. And we, we, I think, have to have some response to this contextual change. Or, or in a sense, what we're going to end up with is potentially people actually saying universities are not an appropriate place for the 18-year-old ambitious would-be entrepreneur. And I think actually that would be a terrible, terrible situation to reach. I think there should be. But it's how we actually accommodate these people who are particularly hungry to get on and do something rather than think it's something they will do somewhere far further down the line. I mean, in a sense, you know, you've only got to look at the dropouts from some of the American universities who, for various reasons, didn't complete their degree. Uh, characters like, I think, one S. Jobs, <laughs> one Gates B, one Zuckerberg M. You know, these are all people who got on with something at university, but the university couldn't accommodate their needs, so off they go. And it's just simply the way the world is. Those are the uh, universities and the degrees that, that have been identified so far by, um, by Chalmers and who were there at this symposium. There's no pretense that these are the only ones, but these are the ones that have been clearly identified and evaluated. So if you know of any of us, then obviously we, we, we know someone who was on the end of, the, of that telephone. Uh, in Sweden, who would be absolutely delighted to know as well, but we can discuss that later. Are we looking purely at whole degree programmes? Yes. Or, so not uh, modules? Not modules. Uh, not modules. That's why, if it was whole, if it was modules, you'd have thousands. That's what I said, it would be much more Not 35. Yeah. yeah. It's, it, it is the whole degree. The, the evidence is that these programmes can work. That doesn't mean to say that they are or ever should be mainstream rather than niche. But the fact is, for the right people, they can work. There are some very valuable and high profile stories emerging, but, and going back to the point, you know, that there are issues. Um, often, there are sometimes quite big egos. 
some of the people we're talking about here have got egos, and we have to overcome that. But actually, for some of them, uh, picking up the disciplines that really thinking about the business can impose can be quite salutary for them. Um, I'll let Nigel and John come before to add anything here, but we're all asked to, to list a few of the issues that we encounter for this symposium, just to provoke discussion. And these are just a few bullet points of, of what each of us put in. Uh, Nigel said that, um, that there has had to be an investment in recruitment, that the high workload of everything, because after all this is not adjunct to the degree, it's integral in the degree, and yet you still got to get through six credits. Yes, there might be some credit for workplace learning, but you've still got to get through 60 credits because the degree and there's the business. So, really, all in all, the students do more. They get a lot more out of it, but they do more. The higher workload has to be appropriate. Um, and uh, one of the issues that, if any of you wanted to talk about later, and I think that is something we ought to for later in the morning, is is that looking at creating one umbrella company to overcome the issues involved with company registration. Um, Coventry, because they take the horse to water but don't force it to drink, there's going to be the risk that some people will come onto the modules in question because they're interested in the subject more than really in their hearts they ever really intend to start a business. And so that in itself, it provides a fantastic fallback but it creates another set of problems, so you've got mixed motives. And you get about half and half, really. You've got about half the group who are very entrepreneurial and go getters who want to do it, and others. It's almost you walk into the room and it divides. It, you just, it just, it just create. They create these groups separately and they coalesce as different groups. Those who are interested in the subject, but not the necessarily the applied part of it. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think as well there's another issue there, and that is that students from different parts of the university are involved, whereas if you've got a senior degree based in one school, the identification is clearer. On the other hand, of course, uh, one of the things we've started to do is to encourage people to share modules with other people so they network widely across the university. I mean, they all find their own networks, but the more we can engineer that by integrating them with other students really does help. Because after all, you know, there's no requirement that the person themselves is the person that has the idea. The good entrepreneurs often steal ideas from other people who don't intend to do anything about it themselves. The more people they can meet, and I'm not saying they have these people, it could very well be that they work with them, but that they need to find the source of ideas in the university as a whole is a massive source of ideas and, and we, we need to uh, we need to deal with that. Um, we have found that one of the things that, that inhibits recruitment to a certain extent is that schools for all their discussion I'm talking about not schools and universities here, I'm talking about schools, schools and colleges. For all their talk about enterprise and entrepreneurship, a lot of people are not yet sold on the message that, in a sense, a non-standard degree is an ideal thing to do. And therefore, you just need something to really sell that message. And we've been really lucky ourselves. Uh, we, we, we were able to get Theo Petitis to stand up and say, this is a great course. And, and, and actually, out of the schools might say, the kids in the schools are more likely to listen to Theo than they are to their own head of sixth form. You know, it's just the world these days. Um, in a perfect world, we'd, we'd run the timetable around these students, if only you could. But you want to build in the space for them to actually work on the business. Um, in, and in, you know, in, in sizable blocks of time. We would not offer a place to anyone who couldn't register and start a business in the UK. In part, that helps Buckingham get around that issue. And so we, we in a sense, um, simply are, are offering a programme that's designed 
market for home studios. Um, what we also want to do is to, to make it a true entrepreneurial experience. We want people to take risks. We want them to find a good opportunity and go for it. At the same time, we want that risk in a sense to be, in a sense, a learning and a personal risk, rather than the thought at the end of it, they could have put an awful lot of money into this. And with our help and mentoring, it's all going down the pan. Because uh, in a sense, you know, in the true context of you can learn as much from failure as you can from success, managed properly, it doesn't actually matter whether this business is an outstanding success or, or something. The issue is they've done it. And who's to say that between the ages of 18 and 2021, 20, you're going to have the best idea of your life? The issue is at some point later on, if you have a really good idea, you're now much more ready to do something about it. You've had the apprenticeship, you've had the grounding. It's not something that you've, as it were, talked about. You've actually done it. The preparation is there. So the business could be something that runs and is then sold or closed or whatever. The main thing is you're not financially out of pocket in an embarrassing way. You're just an all-round stronger person from it. But some of the businesses will definitely roll on after the programme. Uh, I mean, we've got one guy who graduated last year, and I accept he's a mature student. When he arrived at the university, he got an interest in one small business. He's left the university with five businesses, all of them with different partners. Remarkable character. But he's a true, habitual, serial entrepreneur. He finds opportunities, and he finds people he wants to work with. And in, in a sense, he, he, he's, he's an ideal person to tell the story about, but he's not an ideal role model because he's that unusual in some respects. Just before you move on, that, the last issue of funding, and we, what we do is encourage our students and get them ready to apply for things like speed so that they get funding from other sources to help them set up and run their businesses. Uh, we've got student, we've got money we can lend to students at an interest or we can give to them as a propeller fund. So we've got all sorts of ways of getting money and businesses started. Uh, it's that just that sort of should we force them, should we help them dilemma that we face. We, we have a private fund, it's not the university's money, it's a fund that came from legal and general originally and a very generous um, benefactor who sadly has died but has left money in his will for us. But however, because we've expanded so much and I'm going to have 20 students next year, and you'll laugh at 20 students, but I'm going to have 20 students, which is quite a phenomenal increase from having four a few years ago. And uh, we are, we're going to run out of money soon, and so one of my roles at the moment is looking for people who would love to be involved in financially investing in the idea. And there are a few people around who could be interested in the inverted commas putting something back. And they'd be a member of Buckingham Angels, of course, as well, which is one of the things that we offer. To the angels, sorry, to the angels. Yes. Yeah. The angels are a combination of two people from the business school and three from outside, including the lawyer of the man who gave us the large amount of money. Who's the, uh, the girl. And then they're very interested in one know what's happening with the businesses as well, obviously. Two two very quick points. Um, the success of the business is not the determinant of the level of the degree. The academic element is the level of the determinant of the degree. Um, and that is really important. You need as many different people involved as you possibly can. Um, the, the, the other slides for now are really an attempt to capture some of the differences between ours and the postgraduate modules, models that you'll find around. Uh, and because we are only directly involved in these, we felt it was appropriate to update you on this, but we can't talk with any insight because they're not our programmes. But this is our attempt to capture the learning from the other programmes that were there. The postgraduate model tends to be bringing together individuals, uh, with ideas. They could be from within or outside the university. Corporate sponsors, this for example could be a large corporate organisation that's done some research, it now thinks it's commercialisable, but it wants to find someone that it, it can work with and support. 
and so comes into this particular model. It could be professorial or, or postgraduate research, PhD research. It could, the idea could come from anywhere. The university recruits graduate students who are interested in participating in a program where these ideas will be commercialised. The chances are very high they won't be their ideas, but they could be. And then the program comprises modules, experience in an incubator, and the funding side of it uh, sorted out or engineered to a degree by the university. And of course the real secret is selecting the right people, matching them into teams, and matching them with the right ideas. So in a sense the puppet master role is absolutely integral here in making the whole thing work. But we are talking generally about ideas with serious momentum rather than in a sense the more humble get an experience from doing it type idea that's more likely to be part of an undergraduate program. I know Brian said... No, no, I actually want that to answer your question. Oh, I'm sorry, Brian. Right. Because the point that you said, matching them with ideas, do you actually provide them with ideas to pick up or do you just simply rely upon them? The universities tend to bring the ideas in from people. Um, so in a sense, that when the student starts, the ideas are on the table as well. And of course, if you've got the right network of outsiders, then in a sense, you know, they're, they're buying into the program. And it's, it's kind of it's a visibility issue, I think. They're known in the community, and they're known as a potential hatchery for this idea. And there are various ways of doing that. But it's actually integrating the university with the outside world. But then the, the other issue, and this is uh, where I was massively impressed with this approach, but at the same time, it draws the question, and we talked about it while we were with everyone, is it really entrepreneurial? I mean, is it actually, are they the entrepreneurs? Because you're giving them ideas, you're giving them opportunities. They're not generating them. You're matching and supporting and nurturing. The hatchery is a very good uh, way of describing it. And it, it is a sort of big incubation process, isn't it? Mm. The, the idea is not starting with the students themselves. So there's that, that, there's that engineered bit to it. But the programs still work, you know, it's just simply a different approach and a different model. But this is the model that's more developed around the world than is ours. That's, you know, that's the simple reality. I'm trying to the end of the session, I'll do questions. I'll whip through these slides and then we'll, we'll, we'll open it up. By and large, uh, this is an attempt to capture the idea that you start with technology, the outcome is commercialisation through a product. The added value, as time goes on, the added value from the technology goes down and the added value from the business development increases. But in a sense, what you're talking about is both. You need the business, you need the framework, but you need the idea and the technology. Uh, in, in the initial stages, all the value is in the idea. At the end, the value is in the business. So the program, in a sense, is about developing the business around the idea, if, if that makes sense to you. The student experience is, is an interesting one, because the university is controlling the course content and the way it develops it. And at the end, there will be evaluation and assessment and outcomes for the students and for the people with the idea and the investors. And so the overall purpose, bringing into play everyone's expectations and so on, is really uh, an interesting challenge. And so what we were trying to capture here is that involved in this program, student entrepreneurs, if we can call them that, perhaps student would be entrepreneurs, the ventures, the external stakeholders who provide mentoring and um, ideas and investment. But different people have got different intended outcomes. Some of these people want to see a viable business. Some of the students will look to stay with that business and share that priority. Some of the other students actually really want a different type of master's programme and they want to go out with a master's degree. 
So participation in the program is important to them, but then they intend to move on to something else. They're less interested in the actual outcome for the business than they are about the outcome for themselves. Whereas, for example, with our model, where people bring their own ideas to the table, then you've got a different set of desired outcomes for the students involved. So you have to factor in these different expectations. And that, again, brings you back to this whole idea of selection is an absolutely critical issue. Who comes onto these programmes really is a make or break decision. But they must have been all subscribed, so they've got choices. <clears throat> because of the nature of the programme, they can they can choose who they want. Yeah. And I think that was probably the biggest lesson I learned from this. Should could we change our approach to such to one that allow us to have more control over who we got and therefore improving our chances of success enormously? But to do that, you have to. They're all ten years ahead of us, aren't they? In a sense, they've been around for much longer. They've developed and evolved much longer, um, and they were able to do that. Yeah. What What is clear is that you've got on the one hand the development of individuals, on the other hand the development of businesses built around teams, because they invariably all work in teams. You've got functional areas to deal with, and you've got this whole idea that within the team you need people who do stuff. People who, in a sense, pull it all together and the sparky people who are doing the, 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 the grinding and you've got to develop all those capabilities. But that, in a sense, is, is, is sort of linked to how you design the programme, the content of it and the way that you teach it. And this is the final slide. In effect, the, the the role that we have, but I think the role we also need to hand over to the students to a very large extent is that they make sense of what they're doing. We have to try and make sense of what they're doing to improve the programme. The issue is, can we get them to make sense of what they're doing and the experience they have? Because if, if we can't achieve that, then, then, then one key part of the jigsaw is missing. At the end of it, this is all about people exiting the program, having had a, a wonderful experience. And the question is, what have they really learned from it? It's not whether they've done it, it's what they've learned from doing it. The doing it is a vehicle. The doing it is not the end in itself. This is still about education. It's still about a reflective process. And people said to me, you can't make 18-year-olds reflectors or reflective learners. Actually, you can. The issue is to nail it right at the very beginning. But the more, the later you leave it and then try and move them to be reflective learners towards the end of that programme, then it's a really uphill task because they've got into another way of doing it. If you get them from the beginning, believe me, it can be begun. But there has to be a will to do it, and you need everybody uh, involved in pushing them to behave that way. That's really the end of the slide. We, what we wanted to do was to try and get you to, as it were, share your thoughts and experiences, with, with just a view to helping you decide whether you want to take anything away from it. It works for us, it may well not work for you, and that's fine. Well, first of all, thank you for the presentation. <laughs> right, James, you have any questions, comments, observations? Can I have a question? Uh, just seeing about uh, I can't remember the Huddersfield or, um, or Buckingham, when you had the parent company and the projects were within sub companies. It's an issue we've actually just tried to try and deal with. How do you make that work for, say, a business that they start up, it seems to be going okay, and they want to continue with it, but it's under the umbrella of the university's company? I mean, how does that we, work? We sell it. So you just sell it to them? For a pound. Okay. In the old days, when we had a limited liability company, we, we, we sold it. In fact, there were two student complaints, I charged them a pound each. 
Um, and, uh, okay, in that sense, it's already a separate legal that's entity within the umbrella. Now we've got Buckingham Business Enterprises Limited. I've also got another challenge because I've got two businesses that are potentially could grow even quite fast this year. And the big problem is going to be that I've got a, I'm not that registered. And to be VAT registered as a, as a, within the university would get a challenge. So I'm probably going to create two more businesses under the subs subsidiaries of Buckingham Business Enterprise Limited. And I'm, I'm, but the great thing about Buckingham, I'm just talking to the finance director, we just do it. Um, and that's it's it. not all the universities work quite like that. No, no, no. no. And it, you, you can't usually go and have a chat with your pro vice chancellor and your, and your uh, finance director over lunch and sort it all out, which we can at Buckingham. Okay. Do you have that issue in Coventry? We, no, we, we don't. We don't manage the business startup in that way. We certainly looked at managers, not to see if we can pinch it, um, whether it would work for us. Uh, but we we encourage the students to start the businesses. They're their businesses. They run their own businesses. We help them with IP. They fall under our um, IP umbrella, if you like. But on the whole, the university isn't interested because they're micro businesses. They're not, you know, they would get interested if they got interested. Interesting, but uh, as it stands generally, uh, we. You know, we have a lot of support from Speed, and lots of our students get Speed funding because we try and help them and encourage them that way, but it's their business. So the funny thing is, you can imagine our finance manager, the biggest challenge is I have to persuade the auditors every year that these are insignificant businesses to the university's business. And that's the, that's the only big challenge we have. But we work very close with finance department because they hold the money. And we work very close with them and we transfer money between business accounts. We all, we're, we're in that West because the university's in that West. <laughs> So, well, we've even had borrowed money from the university to get things going quickly when we haven't been able to open bank accounts quickly enough. Because if any of you have tried opening bank accounts, it takes time. And my, most of my students are not willing to wait the time. And so we've had that to move on. Uh, our answer is very simple. Uh, the university doesn't, as a university, invest money in businesses. It doesn't take any equity stake and it doesn't make any claim on intellectual property. I think the issue comes obviously with the postgraduate programmes where you are much more likely to have some university intellectual property invested in it and the university has to work out how it's going to deal with that. Uh, but that's you know not the level at which we're working. So I can't really answer for other people. Okay. I think I, I had another question. Um, you made a point between the entrepreneur and the team. Yeah. And the fact that you are, you, you have both. Do you actually have a requirement that the person doing this should actually be a team leader, or can they just be a part of the team whilst they're being entrepreneurial? Well, in our case, we we we, we, we work from the assumption of having a little work individually. Uh, if they choose to work in partnership or actually employ someone else on the program, then that that's up to them. We do not support to engineer teams, so we we. We can't stop it happening. And, and, and their partners could actually be outside the university and, and so on and so forth. And, and we provide support on a case by case basis. Uh, I think others that, that do operate in the team perspective will be really nice. Yeah, we, mine is a situation where I, I have to sometimes force people in together, and, and not force, but encourage and persuade in a, in a, in a gentle way, well, as gentle as I am, um, uh, to do it. But um, it's interesting that the, when the teams come together, the biggest problem that they often have is agreeing who's doing what and where and when when you have different characters involved. And I've had now several cases of students themselves actually coming up with a contractual agreement between themselves as to who's going to do what and when. Because otherwise they would just argue, you know, one who's a finance kind of person and a, and a go getting entrepreneur, getting to actually agree with each other is great fun. But when they do it, they recognise a hell of a lot. Postgraduate model from one of the earlier slides, where the team effort goes into the running of those, uh, you know, high growth potential businesses where there are external investors. The team model obviously works in that context. It's supportive, it's nurturing, it's it's uh, helpful. The entrepreneur then becomes part of that big team, and they understand their role. Now they're volunteering into that in that they they want to join the team that is in existence to be in that creative and supportive framework. Our experience of trying to create teams based on that principle was absolutely disastrous. It just doesn't work with undergraduates, They're not the ones we've worked with anyway. They're too selfish, they're too self-interested, they're too me, 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 they don't want to play with anybody else. 
Um, you know, everybody else always works less hard than they do. It's just a disaster, a mitigated disaster. So I think there's a need to differentiate between levels of maturity, levels of buy-in, and the capability of working in that way. <coughs> Um, that maturity yeah, thing is very interesting because yeah. I, I've got a range of people, my age range is from 18 to 43 and, and the, the older they are, the generally they're far more willing to cooperate and work with each other and, and I think that's, that's, that's a, 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 we tend to have had a lot of people coming to university after they've actually started another university degree somewhere and they've often started somewhere, hating it, walked away, suddenly realised in Butley you can carry on and in two years you've got your degree and are very happy because they can then get, they still get a degree within three years. Yeah. I think that the, the maturity element is the key here. Postgraduates tend to be more mature and can cope with the team element better and therefore they're in a better position to deal with a big idea that won't get off the ground without the team. Whereas the undergraduate model, it can operate with humble ideas, therefore it can be a more individual thing. And you know the maturity will come later. Um, numbers wise, you've been growing each of you in the past few years, so I'm now in margin two, four, and going up to 20. So, what's the limit as to how many you can support in your programs, and what's the, what's the scalability? How do you get more students into the UCPs? The, I mean, my, my, I've got a simple answer to that, and, and it's actually not a quantifiable one, although I've got a number in my mind. But the qualitative answer is this. Everybody in the room, when they're talking about their idea, has to know everybody else in that room to a level where they can trust them implicitly, <coughs> and so they're willing to talk freely. Once you're beyond that number, and that they don't feel they know everyone, then this won't work. And I, I, I kind of have in mind that somewhere between 20 and 24 is the realistic upper limit on that. We haven't talked. And, and this, this is the amazing thing about the three of us, we don't have to talk to each other without often agreeing. I've got a feeling in my bones of 20. And again, I don't have rules and regulations. I don't have to tell anybody telling me anything. Apart from, by the way, Nigel, who would like you to not lose too much money is often asked if we are a charity. Uh, but we've gone past that stage now. So it's, it's again, and, but you've, you've generally got more than me, both of you, haven't you? So, I, I'm a bit greedy, I want more. I, I think um, I like well, our number for this year is years. twenty. So we've got twenty, but actually oh, total over, over we've got year. twenty this year. This, this year's intake. So about we've got sixty. 20. You've got fifty-five. About sixty-five over, 65. Over, yeah, over the three years. And how many have you got a husband? We we tend to to recruit around fifteen. I've got so eighteen over have, two years. We're, we're mm -hmm. under the level, um, so we we could be a bit bigger, but. But obviously, um, I, I mean, to be honest, if I was being really good, if I was the other thing from my spirit in this room, so I need to be careful. To, to me, the, the smaller number is better, because obviously you're working with small groups, but you know, you've got the economic issue of it. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's um, the smaller the number, there's a lot of. What's your staff's generation? I don't understand that. Well, the, what, I mean, what the ratio is actually quite high. But okay, this, is, nice. this, is, this is allowed to operate in a different way. But of course, they're not on their own as a group of 15 for the whole time. They share modules with other people to gain the economies. Some of the time, they're on their own. And when they're really working on the business, they're on their own in, in, in their particular group. But we don't all the teaching to that size of group. Our, our staff student ratio is very high because all of our teaching now is by our team, which is why we need more, more numbers because we've grown the academic team to try and make sure that we're in control of the process. We take the modules away from the business school because we want to manage the timetable, we want to manage the integration and all of those other things. So that then puts pressure on you to create bigger numbers. Selection is key though because the more you take, the greater the dropout, the worse it looks. So better to be modest in terms of your intake and take the right sort of people, but you've always got that balance of having enough students to make it viable, but not having so many students that are outside the parameters of the type of 
capabilities that you're looking for that they're failing because that looks bad as well. So it's a real I think we have time for one last patient question about here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm interested in assessments of um, overall. Um, I'm interested in the percentages of assessment of how you assess and also any um, interaction with business community to assess and how you deal with that if there is. Um, yes, I'm, I'm amazed at it, but Buckingham is not renowned for following QAA, but we've actually just passed QAA. And uh, amazingly, I was actually asked to do some statistics on things and actually have got the information as to what our exact uh, assessment system is. But it ranges from exams, yes, horror, horror, through to pitching. And 60 out of the 360 units, we call them units, not credits, are relevant to the way the business is operated. Not, as John said, not the success of the business, but there are, we have a quarterly business review that they have to write obviously every quarter, not only saying what they've done, but planning what they're doing for the future and are assessed on themselves against what they achieve. So that kind of thing. So we've got pitching, we've got um, uh, presentations, we've got a whole range of things. I've, I've got to get into other systems of recording things like, like a lot learning logs and all those kind of things. But I'm not, I'm not an academic well, well, business. Well, what about the uh, business community? Yeah, yeah, that's one of our biggest problems. The people who the students love the greatest are real people doing real jobs, coming in every year for a term and teaching. Now that challenge is getting them accepted and doing it in an official way, um, but we work it. In, in our case, one, one third is, is the specific to the business and, and one bit classified as relatively non-conventional. Two thirds is conventional assessment. The external community are involved in the non-conventional uh, in, in a variety of ways. Our expectations, personally, that are at the end of the first year that they can do in effect a dragon's den pitch of the concept. At the end of year two, they can sit in front of a business panel and defend their business plan. We don't actually assess the business plan as a document, but we assess their ability to defend it. And the, 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 the other um, key element is the ability to capture all the learning structured for portfolio so they get credits for the work that they've done. Right, um, I think we've, we've run a little over time. Um, Okay, well I should like formally to thank uh, John, Nigel and Joe for their presentation today. It's been very interesting and um, I look forward to continuing the conversation over lunch.